Look over at your neighbor and tell them, Happy 5th of July! We would have done it Happy 4th, but that was yesterday. So if you missed that, it was happy. How many of y'all had a good 4th? Yeah, pretty good bunch, Evie. Pretty good bunch. Good, good, good. Hey, uh, um, so we're going to talk about freedom today. I don't know how I come up with that. You know, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I thought, well, you know, why don't we just talk about freedom on this weekend? And so I want to I want to put this question, a couple of questions out to you as we get ready uh, to start here just in a moment. Um, what would your definition of freedom be? How how how, how do you define freedom and and uh, what does your freedom mean to you I just want you to think about that for a little bit and, and, and I might even open the floor just in a moment um, to get some feedback I had some really good feedback so if you don't have good feedback don't raise your hand <laughs> okay thank you uh, the uh, what's your definition of freedom what does freedom mean to you? And here's the last question. What's your freedom cost you? What's your freedom cost you? See, this weekend, and we should celebrate. How many of y'all know this is a really good weekend? It's a really good time for us as Americans to remember where we came from, to remember the price that was paid for our freedom. We get to come to church and don't have to worry about some jack leg, bootleg militia man coming in and kicking the doors down. And hauling us off to prison. Anybody thankful for freedom today? Amen. Yeah, it's a good day. It's a good day. And so, in the spirit of celebration, I don't want us to be so shallow that we just gloss over the depth of the meaning of this thing. Amen. So I want you to think about that. Now we're going to pray. I'm going to dismiss Bob's class and... Uh, uh, Debbie, that where you are you taking them down, Deb? So let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word today. Prepare our hearts to receive your word, Lord God, and we thank you that freedom is your plan. Whom the Son set free is free. And so we thank you for freedom. Our freedom is in you, Lord Jesus, and in no place else do we find it. We thank you for a government that has honored you, Father God, in times past. Lord God, we pray for a government that will continue to honor you in the present. Father, we thank you for the simple right, the freedom of religion to just gather today as Americans to freely assemble and to worship you. What a beautiful freedom that we are enjoying. Thank you for that freedom. Lead us, guide us. Speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody agreed. Say amen. amen. Okay, Bob's class. Little ones, you're dismissed to go downstairs. So I want you to think about those questions. What's your definition of freedom? What does your freedom mean to you? And what does your freedom cost you? So before uh, we open the floor up, uh, I'll share a, a couple of things and a couple of thoughts so that you kind of know where I'm coming from today with today's message. Um, we're still talking about the prevailing church. If I say the prevailing church. We read in the seven, uh, the, about the seven uh, churches in the uh, first or the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. Those seven churches, uh, the church of Smyrna we'll talk about today did not enjoy such freedoms as what we enjoy right here. How many of y'all know that there are a lot of other believers gathered in other places secretly today? They don't get to enjoy the freedoms as a nation as we have gathered here. And, and we see some things changing in America. The America of my childhood, the America of my youth, is not the America that I see today. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of stuff that's going on all around us. And so, freedoms that we have taken for granted, how I many y'all know, could disappear from a national perspective. Now, if we go back to where we were at uh, about 250 years ago, 
July the 4th, there's a declaration that's made, a declaration of independence. And a revolution begins, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a group of men, there's a group of people that rise up, and they write in this declaration. Let me, let me read it for us so we, can, so we can get it right. This is the second paragraph in this declaration. See if you hold these truths, and, and let's, let's talk about biblical freedom, God freedom, Versus man's ideology of freedom. And so here's, what's, here's what our framers, here's what our founding fathers wrote in this declaration. We hold these truths. Everybody say truths. So if you identify with this and you say, yes, I agree, where does this truth come from? I believe that Jesus, John 8 says, you'll know the truth. You finish it for me. John 8 says, you'll know the truth and the truth will? Thank God for freedom. See? So does freedom come from man or does freedom come from God? Just a question. Just, just putting some stuff out there. I want us to be thinking about this. And then in that very same chapter, just a few verses down, huh? and whom the Son is set free is free indeed. That's what your Bible says. You can quote it right back to me. Thank you. We hold these truths to be self-evident. It is Captain Obvious. It is so apparent. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, this is a powerful line. That all men are created equal. How many of all believe that? Hmm? Thank God. Now listen, we live in a world that is so racially divided, so prejudiced. I believe that all men are created equal in the image of God. All men have sinned, fallen short, and there's but one Savior. Simple enough. Amen. And in that Savior we find freedom. All men are created equal. But don't stop there. And endowed by their creator, listen to this, with certain unalienable rights. Certain. Sure. Concrete. And their unalienable rights. In other words, no one, no person, if these are absolute genuine truths, it hasn't got anything to do with a government or a lack of a government, whatever, it's, it's tyrannical or this, that, whatever. When you talk about freedom in Christ, it's an unalienable right. It's life, liberty, everybody say liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if it's from God, nobody can take it from you. They can lock you in a prison. They can shut you away. I have a, a movie here with me today. Marsh and I support an organization we have for a lot of years. How many of y'all have ever heard of a pastor from back in the 1940s and all the way he lived up to 2001? His name's Richard Wormbrand. How many of y'all have ever heard that name, Richard Wormbrand? Some of you have, it's, and that's okay. Uh, uh, it's been a while. Maybe you've slept since then. I don't know, and so... Uh, Richard Wormbrand was a Romanian pastor. And in 1945, as the war was just ending up, the Allies are coming in from the Western Front, pushing the Nazis out, and the, they're starting to do the whole mop-up, clean-up thing. The war is finishing up, and everything is pretty well done. And, 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 and how many of y'all know Russia is coming in from the East? Right? History. And what happened in Romania, communist Russia came in, and some of the testimonies of that era was the Nazis treated us better than the communists treated us. How many of y'all know that's a tough, that's a kind of a, that ain't much to measure up to. Right? Okay, I've got Hitler over here, and I've got Mussolini over here. I've got, wow. And so, Richard Wormbrand, here was what he was arrested for, uh, and imprisoned. He spent three years, the first three years of his imprisonment, his first sentence, in solitary confinement. He never saw another human being other than his torturers. That's the only people he saw. They would come, take him out of solitary confinement, beat him, torture him, and put him back in. Three years, locked away. The next five years after that... <laughs> They put him in a group cell, but just to strike fear in the rest of the group cell, they would come take him out, they would beat him and torture him more, and then they would take him back. How many of y'all know hell would love to strike fear in your hearts and streak, huh? Hell can't take what God's given you if you won't surrender it. 
I want to share something with you. Listen, don't you surrender what God's given you. It's hard to take back ground once you give it up. Amen? It's hard to take back ground once you give it up. Don't give up. Look up at your neighbor. Don't give up what God's given you, huh? Encourage your neighbor. Don't give up on what God's given you. So Pastor Wormbrand spent eight years in prison. And this Romanian prison, this is what he was in prison for. He preached these words boldly. He said, Christianity and communism are incompatible. Christianity and communism are incompatible. Now, this is being videoed, and it's going to go out on YouTube and all that whole thing right there. And I want to just verify I agree with him all these years later. Anybody else want to say amen on that when you're in? You can. I choose Christianity. I choose Christ. I choose the freedom in which Christ has set me free over communism any day of the week. Sorry, Bernie. Everybody understood that jab, right? Okay, I mean, if I need to elaborate, I can, but I think there's a whole crowd that's following. There's some things that maybe are attractive in some of that stuff, but I'm going to tell you what, the end of it is not an inalienable right. I heard a definition a whole lot of years ago that really changed and impacted my thinking about freedom. I don't know... Tiny, if it was James Robinson, you and I have talked about this before. I don't know if it was James Robinson that uh, where this quote originated from, but it was James Robinson, preacher James, uh, uh, life for today. Some of you may be familiar with him or not. It doesn't matter. You measure the quote for yourself just because it's a quote doesn't mean it's this, that, or whatever, but it had impact in my life. Here was his definition of freedom. He said this, Freedom is not the right to do whatever you want. It is the ability to do that which is right. Strong. Strong. See, I lived a bunch of years kind of in shallow freedom. My freedom really didn't cost me a whole lot. I, I can't actually say that my freedom has really even cost me much yet. From the day I've been born, I've been blessed. I was born in a Christian home in America. Yes. Anybody say very blessed? Very blessed. Hmm? Very blessed. Had my home not even been a Christian home, being born in America is worth a bunch. Hmm? I've had the good fortune to get to travel and see some of these other countries and, and be exposed to some of these other uh, cultures and, and some things like that. 1985 was a huge impact. It was the first trip I ever made to Haiti. And in 1985, I saw the results of an oppressed people who were being subjected to uh, the laws of voodoo and, and of Satanism mixed with Christianity and Catholicism. You won't talk about a religious cocktail. It was wild. If you didn't come in alignment, if you were an enemy of the state or an enemy of the official religion, you could get what they call firestoned. I didn't know what that was when I got to Haiti, but they firestoned 22 people while I was in Haiti. Marsha and I, our pastor at that time, and it was my first mission trip ever, Donna. They firestoned 22 people. Here's what firestoning is. They put a tire over you, your arms are inside, they douse you with gasoline, and they burn you alive inside the tire. Firestone. We were there for just a little over a week. They firestone 22 people in the time that we were there. We had guards that were in the place where we were at. We were staying with Pastor Andre Lewis, and he was our host pastor and was working on an orphanage and some other things that was there. Whenever you come up the stairs to the room that we were staying in, we were in, in the upstairs. Well, first of all, around the outside of the compound, or I say compound, it was just a house with a couple of extra lots around it. There was a concrete wall, not quite as tall as these walls here, but close, probably about as high as those lights are. And at the top of this concrete wall, while the concrete was soft, they had embedded glass bottles. After it set, they went through and they broke all of those glass bottles off, and so it was literally shards of sharp glass all the way around with iron, 
speared looking gates and this is a pastor's house this is where missions teams come to work from and I thought wow I'm not in Howe County anymore it's good to be free it's good to not be a prisoner in your own home Anybody relate with that, with this whole COVID thing that's going on right now? Kind of feel like, huh? We take coming to church for granted just a few weeks ago. We didn't get to come to church for a while. I know about you, I can't miss coming to church. I mean, I miss some of you. Tiny and I was talking about the whole mask wearing thing, and, 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 and I'm not necessarily against that. I, I think people like me maybe ought to wear a mask. It would be helpful for little children not to, you know, scare them and... Uh, okay, stay with me, stay with me. Second time today, all right, stay with me. Now, uh, what does freedom mean to you? I had, had one person talk to me that had come out of the uh, uh, sex trafficking business. Slave. You know what that definition of freedom was? A changed heart changed life, changed opportunity, didn't know anything about God. Grew up under curses in a, in a, uh, a home where a mom served witchcraft. Another man was sharing with me about his, and his was the hardness of heart, bitterness, and hatred had set in his heart because his son got murdered. There are a lot of bondages in this world. Anybody say amen? amen? See, there are some things that governments can't set you free from and only in Christ Jesus. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. And I want to shed a line for you. And then we're going to go to the church of Smyrna, the prevailing church. Jesus said to Peter, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. The prevailing church is a free church. Everybody say the free church. It's what we're going to talk about today. Free church. It's not a matter of, 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 of what the, the sheetrock and the paint and the carpet is. It's a matter of the people who come. You are the church. And if we're going to prevail, if we're going to walk as overcomers, we have to walk as free men and free women. We have to walk in the freedom that's been delivered to us by Christ, which is greater than. I'm thankful for a government that has written in a declaration, we declare... That you, and you, and you, and you, and you are endowed by your Creator with an unalienable right, several of them. Everybody say life, life. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm thankful to be born in that country. I'm thankful that God has blessed America. But what happens, what happens in a world divided what happens if communism were to win here? Huh? What, just, just think. See, we think these things for granted. We think these things could never change. But history is full of account after account after account. Romans 8 and 2. The law of the spirit of life. Everybody say the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus. Key phrase has made me, past tense, everybody say, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Look over at your neighbor and tell him, I'm free in Jesus. Huh? See, what, what we believe matters, doesn't it? We say that all the time. A few weeks ago, I asked you, do you believe that the blood of Jesus is blessed? Right? And then we, then we begin to talk about, well, then the devil can't curse what God's blessed. If you're under the blood, you're under the blessing. You're not under the curse. Anybody agree with that? It matters what you believe. I believe the blood of Jesus is a blessed thing. I'll never quit talking about the blood of Jesus because it is the power of that blood that has set me free because my freedom is in, in Christ before it's in a declaration. It's an inalienable right. We have been endowed by our Creator. Man didn't give it to me and man can't take it away. Thank God we live in a Christian nation irregardless of what some have said, some want to define, some of them want to 
to rewrite history, but I can read and I know what the declaration said. And I'm glad God blessed America and I'm praying for him to continue. Anybody say amen. amen. Freedom needs a voice. Freedom is inside you. If you're in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, if you've got Jesus in you, you have the law of the spirit of life dwelling in you because he dwells in you and you have been made free from the law of sin and death. You're not under any bondages anymore. You have unrestricted access to the throne of God. Higher than the White House, higher than the Supreme Court, you have access unrestricted to the throne of grace. And he said, come boldly. Everybody say go. Huh? That's where we need to go. Um, I am so thankful for America. America's got all of its problems and I see a lot of stuff going on in the church. The the America of my youth is not the America of this stage of my life, but I'm going to tell you what, my God has not changed. Amen. Isn't that good news? That's good news for every one of us today. How do you define, how do you define faith? Uh, whoever's got the controls on my sound, Justin or whoever, somebody, I want to, somebody raise your hand and I'm going to bring you a mic. What's your definition? I'll share James Robinson's again and I've just kind of adopted this myself. Freedom is not the right to do whatever you want. It is the ability to do what is right. As a, as a young man coming out from my parents' house, I, uh, I want to spread my wings and fly. I want freedom. I want the apron strings cut. I don't want my daddy telling me what I can and can't do anymore. Hmm? I was one of those. Preacher's kid, right? You all know about them. All right. And so I pursued what I wanted to pursue. But as I've... First of all, the prodigal came home. And then as I've aged and grown in Christ, I've found that I've had the freedom to do, to make choices, godly choices... In this freedom. See, Paul wrote to the Galatian church and he said, You've been called unto liberty. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. He talks about, You've been called unto freedom, unto liberty. Then he said, But don't use that liberty as an occasion for your flesh. Don't use that liberty just to serve yourself, but by love, right? By love, serve one another. Serve one another. You're free to serve one another. You're free. No, nobody can take that from you. Anybody want to share a definition and what freedom means to you? Grover. Grover. Freedom to me. You're on. Freedom to me is not being under the control of any person or substance against my will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you know Grover's story, all right, if I elaborate just a little bit on that. When he talks about not being under the control of any substance, how many of y'all know there are a lot of bondages we can get into in this world? Huh? You ought to have seen this guy ministering in Africa last October. And he's ministering, and, and in times before that, in some of the news that we got back, um, and he's dealing with some of the alcoholics. Anybody glad to be free from that bondage? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He sets us free. Anybody, anybody else? We're going to take one or two more. Freedom. Introduce yourself and your family to the church. First time with us at Westside. I'm Andrew Easling, um, and it's my wife Rebecca and Jane, and I got two more downstairs. Jane, I would just love to have hair like that for one day in my <laughs> life. That's beautiful hair, baby girl. Go ahead. Um, my definition would be uh, the ability to choose to do what is right or wrong and to receive the just reward for those yeah. actions accordingly. And then from God, that's the way it goes down, isn't it? Amen. You make the right one, it's going to work out. You make the wrong one, uh, that one will, yeah. Okay, good, good. Take one more. Anybody else want to share one more? Going once. Where you got? John. All right. Get over here just a moment. I know that this is a little unorthodox for what we normally do. Uh, I'm always really cautious about who I give a microphone to. 
Let's pray in Jesus' name right now. Um, in all honesty, freedom to me is to be a slave to Jesus Christ. Um, D.L. mentioned that verse in John that we love so much. Uh, but the verse ahead of that, exactly right. Jesus says, if you're truly my disciples, you'll be faithful to my teachings. Yeah. And you will know the truth and the truth That's will exactly set you the free. Way it says. That's right. His teaching is complete and total surrender and submission. Submission to him. So true freedom is to be a slave of Jesus Christ. The elongated definition of that is if you will lose your life for Christ's sake. How many all know what it says? You'll find it. Amen. So let's look in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at the church in Smyrna. Now let me, as we're going there, finish some of the story about Pastor Wormbrand. Uh, maybe some of you have, have seen the movie. I've got it. If somebody would like to borrow it, it's the only one I have. And so we'll loan it out or we could even show it sometime here. How many of y'all have ever heard of the organization called Voice of the Martyrs? Maybe that one ring a bell. Pastor Wormbrand, the guy that I was telling you about that's been tortured for Christ is the name of the movie, is the man that founded Voice of the Martyrs. And in this magazine, this is one of the uh, places that Marsh and I put some of our mission money into, uh, as well as the, the things that we support here at church. The movie Tortured for Christ goes through and it details, it's a documentary uh, kind of a movie. And it talks about his, his faith and, and, and the cost of his, what's freedom cost him? So I want to tell you the rest of the story as we go into this real quickly. And in 1945, he's arrested for preaching that Christianity and communism are incompatible. He spends eight years in prison. He's released only to be arrested again and he receives a 25-year sentence because he goes right back to it and he's right back to preaching again and he's going at it. So he's already spent eight years in incarceration. He winds up in total of spending 14 years. In 1964, he was purchased out of his... Let me say it this way. His freedom was purchased... And you think about the time frame of this. I mean, I know the world's getting smaller. 1964, uh, still quite a while ago, that's long before a lot of the modern things that we have today and the communications and stuff. He is incarcerated in Romania in a dark hole in a communist prison. But there's a bunch of Norwegian Christians who are familiar with his name and his work. The going price for the Communist Party is about $1,900 on average to purchase someone out of their Communist prison. They set his at $10,000. $10,000 in 1964 is a significant amount of money. Listen, these Norwegian believers... Their care for their fellow pastor. Not even a pastor in their country. He don't necessarily even go to their country. He comes to the U.S. They ponied up $10,000. And I didn't do the math. I don't know what that would be equivalent to today in our terms. But I'm sure the price of inflation, it costs a lot of money to get a preacher out of jail anymore. So... I keep preaching like this. You guys may have to take up a second offering. There may change come one of these days. Amen? Be all right. I'm not going to change what I'm saying, and I don't care if it chaps them all. It'll just have to chap them, okay? That's just the way it is. The truth doesn't get changed because of, right, culture. Listen, we need to honor that. You need to make your mind up, church. Listen to me. You need to decide what you believe and why you believe it because what you believe about truth, what you believe about blessing, what you believe about freedom matters. And I believe the framers wrote that from a biblical perspective. And we are endowed by our Creator. Whether they accept a Creator today or not, I still believe. How about you? In 1964, he's bought out of prison. They raised the money. I wonder if that might have changed his perspective on the verse that says you've been bought with a price. Not only was the price of blood paid for him... Can you imagine how humbling that would be to you? I, I really can't. 
that a group of believers would love you so much that they would rescue you out of that hell hole. And they would raise... Isn't that, isn't that something? See, that Galatians 5 that we was talking about there a while ago, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. Free to do that. Free to do that. In 1966, he's now in the United States. And he appears before the United States Senate. It's a Senate hearing. And he comes before the Senate with no shirt on. They're asking him about religious freedom. They're asking him about the persecuted church. And he simply comes in with no shirt on. And he shows the cost of his freedom in Christ. He has 18 Huge marks across his torso. Hey gang, I ain't, my freedom ain't cost me much. I've had some people badmouth me. I've had some people not like me. I even had some people that got mad because some of their... They were dealers. And some of the people they were dealing to got saved. And it kind of cut into their business. And they didn't like that. So they sugared our gas tank. Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough if they'd have done it to my pickup, but they got Marsha's car, big old nice brown Bonneville. It's like a boat, man. A big family ghetto cruiser of some kind, you know. It's Marsha cruising around in that thing. Yeah. Sugared the gas tank. Cut our tires. Ooh. They make them every day. Didn't cost me much. Not that I'm a fan of having to buy new tires when I had good tires on. Not much of a price on freedom. I, I, I've not spent much. Nobody's threatened me with fire stoning. When we were in that upper room there and, and, and Pastor Andres, I started to tell you this story about that. When you got to the top of the stairs, we had a guard sleeping out there because outside there was a voodoo, a local, high, uh, a local voodoo high priest that hated Pastor Andre. And then when he saw Americans come in, he knew that he was about to get a bump up and it was going to, you know, cause some rile in the community and, and there was some support there. And so he wanted to scare us off. This is 1985. And so every night... About dark, they would all be out there drunk and carrying on, shouting, hollering. They're, they're, they're putting big voodoo curses on us, but how we all know you can't curse what God's blessed, huh? And when you know that, what you believe matters. And so you know what I done? I went to bed and went to sleep. And I woke up refreshed and ready to go back out and work. And we would step over the drunk voodoos and go do our business. And... And I don't say that uh, to be light. What a shame to be in that bondage. What a shame to be in that, that kind of place. We were sleeping up there. There was a guard slept on the outside of the door. The door was locked. And it wasn't a round knob like that. It was one of the lever knobs. You know, and so you crank the lever down. And the alarm system on the lever knob was a Pepsi bottle. So if they started rattling the door, the Pepsi bottle would, would fall off. And they would wake up the guard on the inside. One of them was carrying a club. The other one had a club made out of an axle. It's like by the time you get that thing, this guy was a little Haitian. By the time you get that half axle hoisted, they're going to be all over us. And I'm going to have to bail out the window and go over that glass-infused wall out there to get away from them, you know. kind of. A... It's a blessing to live in America. And don't take your rights for granted. Hmm? Have some opportunity to make some decisions. You say, well, this, this thing's, you're just talking about politics. No, I'm talking about the Word of God. Freedom's all throughout the Word of God. And in Christ is where my freedom comes. I've been endowed by my Creator. No man can take it away from me. You can pass law that says I can't come to church. Guess what? I'm going to come to church anyway. We'll find a way. Freedom always finds a way. It always finds a way. Church this morning, we'll finish up right here. Church this morning, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel, the messenger, or the pastor, the angel of the church in Smyrna. Everybody say Smyrna. 
That's important, and I want to define that word for you just a little bit. Smyrna, the Greek word Smyrna, that's translated Smyrna, is taking is it's taken from the Hebrew word that means myrrh. How many of y'all are more familiar with that word? Maybe myrrh. Myrrh is an extract from a plant that when you crush the plant, everybody say crushed. When you crush the plant, it puts off a beautiful aroma. Some of you have been going through some crushing things. Pastor Wormbrand went through some crushing things. Some of us may have some crushing things before us. You know, I don't even always have to be going through a bad thing to put off a bad aroma. Anybody besides me ever just wake up on the wrong side of the bed? That's the phrase we, right? Anybody? Huh? All right, if anybody, Greg raised his hand, anybody else want to do that, we're going to have prayer right now. Lay your hands on them. That was a loaded question. What happens when we sung about the new wine in, in the one course? How many of y'all know you can't have the new wine until the grape gets crushed? You can't have the myrrh. This city of the seven cities that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, is, it's historically uh, looked at as the most beautiful city of all seven of these. It's a city that if you're a Christian, is a crushing place. It's, theologians talk about the persecuted church, and it's always in association with Smyrna the persecuted church. But it's also an association with this, that as they were being crushed, they put off this beautiful aroma. It was something that would fill the air. And something so horrible and so bad and so crushing would have such a beautiful end to it. What's your, what's your freedom cost you? And how do you react when it's challenged? What, are you, what have you paid for your freedom. What does your freedom mean to you? To the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things. Now listen how Jesus introduces himself to them. This letter that comes in about 94 AD, I would not necessarily want to be the pastor of this church and get this letter. It's kind of a downer. Right? This is not, I mean it's, Sometimes God don't always tell you what you want to hear. They're already in a jam. They're already going through stuff. And he says, and there's more to come. Woo, feel goosebumps now. Oh, Holy Ghost, yeah. Right? Some of you have been being crushed under some things. Horrible things. Terrible things. Some of them of your own making. Some of them just getting handed out to you. Can we go through those kinds of things when you, when you follow this story right here? The heart that's in this pastor really challenges the heart that's in this pastor. I'm the American breed of pastor, and it's kind of the don't tread on me. Huh? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Listen, think. You need to be thankful you was born an American because you got some things worth fighting for, gang. You got some things worth fighting for, and there's a right time and a right place to do that, and you need to be doing it right now. Freedom need listen to me. Freedom needs a voice in America, and you're it. Whether it's freedom that our Constitution guarantees, or it's freedom of somebody that's bound by alcohol. Or freedom of somebody that's in the slave trade or freedom of somebody that's got the hardness and the hurt and the bitterness, the crushing pain. Can you imagine trying to come to a place where you can deal with forgiving someone that's murdered your son? Wow. I know your works. This is verse 9. He's, well, he, he, let me finish verse 8. He said, These things saith the first, the last. I'm the beginning, I'm the end which was dead and which is alive, the reason that he introduces himself as that is to give them hope in a situation that's going to cost some of them their life. But how many of all know, this is what the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Historically, 
we, we're celebrating July the 4th as our Declaration of Independence. Do you know that June 29th is historically the day that the Apostle Paul was killed? Yeah. And so in the martyr world, in, in that world, there's a bunch of people um, in, in this voice of martyrs always makes a big deal out of that, June the 29th. And they have a big celebration for those that have been killed this past year. And every year, there's more names added to the list. We live in a world that talks about all this life matters, that life matters. I believe that all lives matter and there's a lot of Christians dying because of nothing else. They might be good to you or be a blessing to you. Be careful around those kind of people. They might tell you the truth. Right? We live in a, we live in a fallen world, church. Don't you ever forget that. And don't take for granted. Listen to me. Listen to me, young people, for sure. Don't you take for granted the freedoms that's been given to us. They're worth fighting for. They're worth standing up for. Don't compromise and be a voice of freedom even in the world that's coming. It doesn't mean that you hate people. It doesn't mean that you're ugly. It just means you're standing up for what God's Word says. I'm the first on the laugh. I was dead. Now I'm alive. I know your works and your tribulation. Everybody say tribulation. Everybody say poverty. <laughs> you got trials, you got tests, you've got all these problems going on, you, you've got persecution going on, and you're in poverty. Poverty is not a godly thing. I, I've heard some really crazy messages on prosperity, but on the flip side of that, I've heard some really crazy messages on poverty. One of the other pictures that I have branded from that trip to Haiti in 1985, I never forget it and I don't ever want to forget it. I want it to mark my heart and for it not to really heal that much. I want to remember the picture of my beautiful wife holding a little Haitian baby that is about to starve to death. The little stomach is bloated. And so before you start glorifying poverty to me, you need to come go with me and hold a starving baby. Then you glorify poverty to me. materialism on one side. When, when Scripture... How many of y'all know when God teaches about prosperity? He teaches balanced. He teaches balanced. And when He talks about poverty, He doesn't glorify poverty. He doesn't glorify it here. He just says, this is something that you're dealing with, but I've got an answer. I've got a solution. And He says, but you're rich. I saw in the Haitian people, I saw some riches that I don't see sometimes in America. I saw some deep faith that I don't see here sometimes, and I'm not trying to glorify or minimize that. Here's what your word says. Here's what your Bible says about prosperity. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. But here's where you get the power to manage prosperity. He said, even as your soul prospers. Materialism and greed on one side is just as big a bondage as poverty is on the ultra extreme of the other side. And what we find is God in the middle saying, if your soul prospers, you can handle whatever comes. Amen? You can handle prosperity and you can handle poverty. The key is the soul must prosper. Amen? That's 3 John verse 2 if you want to look it up. Now then, he goes on and he says, but you're rich. I know the blasphemy. So they're slandering. They've been slandered. They've been maligned. They've been talked down. How many of y'all know that we're living in a world where Christianity in America is being marginalized? When you take God, whenever, whenever the, 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 the government, whenever our Constitution says, talks about separation of church and state, it was to protect the church from the state, not vice versa. When you talk about removing God from government, you know what you have? A godless government. I'm still for God bless America. I'm still for putting on our dollar in God we trust. Maybe that's stroking your fur the wrong way. Turn your cat around. It'll go better. Not mad at anybody. I just believe very much in freedom. And I'm going to be a voice of it as long as I have a voice. I'm going to talk about the freedom that's been given to us. Verse 10. They're going through tough times. They're going through hard places. And then he says, fear none of those things which you shall suffer. How many of y'all want to get that letter? Oh, by the way, here's your letter from 
the Apostle John. And the Spirit of God spoke to him while he is in prison, right? He's isolated in this work camp, this, this Alcatraz island called Patmos. And, and in, this, in this isolation, the Spirit of God visits him. How many of y'all know the Word of God's not bound? We can read that here just in a moment in 2 Timothy. comes to him and says, I know you're going through this and this and this. Don't fear any of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison. Man, this is exciting stuff. I want to go to that church. That you may be tried. And you'll have tribulation ten days. Be faithful. Look over at your neighbor and tell him, be faithful. See, that's a really big word. For those framing and founding fathers, how many of y'all know they put it all on the line when they signed their John Hancock? Huh? I grew up hearing that phrase all my life. I didn't know when a little boy who John Hancock was, but he must have been somebody special. Turns out he was. And they pledged their lives and their treasure, their wealth to one another. And we'll give it all. What if things change in America? This is a what if. This is not a scare thing of this. The America of my youth is not the America of today. What if your freedom in Christ cost you more than what you've paid up to now? How far are you willing to go? And I know that that's, that's kind of hard to ask until we're faced with that, but I think it'll make it a whole lot easier if you've made resolution within your heart. No matter what it takes, I'm going to go all the way. The Apostle Paul said, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Those are not just cheap talk. Now then, um, he'll cast some of you into prison. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Uh, I'd kind of like to switch churches. It's kind of what I'd like to do right here. Let me go down there to... Uh, let's go to Philadelphia. That's that lovey church down there. They like everybody and get along, right? The church of brotherly love. He that hath... I'm going to go to a new town... He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. He don't give them any, hey, I've got some things against you. Right? Some of the churches he said, right, to the, Ephesian, to the Ephesian church, hey, you've left your first love. I've got some things against you here. We need to get some. He says, you've got some more things coming against you. How many of y'all ever been in one of those crushing places where all of this has been going on, going on, going on, and you're feeling crushed? And then when you didn't think it could get any worse, then it did. Everybody say, be faithful. Let's finish up. Uh, Aaron, you want to come, son, and we'll... we'll uh, I want to run you through a couple more passages right here real, real quickly. I want you to look at Isaiah 61 and verse 1. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's telling him that to continue to preach this gospel, the gospel that I've preached, Jesus Christ, and, and then he talks about his bonds. I mean, I know that book that we're looking at, that book that we hold so precious, more than a book, a lot of it was written from prison. Prison doors. All kinds of bondages. And then he says this, but the Word of God's not bound. Coming out of a prison was this fragrant aroma, the writings of the Apostle Paul. And they still continue to enhance. Look over at your neighbor and tell them, boy, you smell good today. Uh, you smell good today. You smell like a bunch of Christians that can go through a crushing and keep your face right and your heart right and your spirit right. See, if we know, if we know the outcome, if we know the end. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. Jesus quotes this in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth where He's raised up. And they hand Him this scroll, the scroll of Isaiah. 
You can read this in Luke 4.18. It's powerful because whenever you read prophecy, this one has been fulfilled. And so Jesus comes into the synagogue. They hand him this and it says he stands up to read this line right here. So a couple thousand years ago, Jesus is reading this line. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach, to proclaim good tidings. Everybody say anointed. Anointed is a very powerful word. In Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27, Scripture Isaiah said, it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. That is the anointing that breaks the shackles off. It is the anointing of God, the law of the Spirit. L let me say this about church. How many, I think maybe church is a little too bound anymore. I think we might ought to get a little freer in church. God forbid the Holy Spirit would actually come in and really light us up a little bit and somebody raise their hand and say, Woo! We can't do that. That's just... They thought they were drunk on the day of Pentecost. God's not being medicated for anxiety. He's not going to glance over at the angel and say, you're going to have to do something about them. They're getting wild down there. My dad used to always say, don't ever worry. Here, here's, here's advice from an old tailgate preacher right here. Don't ever worry about a little wildfire. There's always enough wet blankets around. Put it out. Huh? I think Dad was right. He preached 20-some years. I'm on 33. Seen a lot of wet blankets. Did you hear them? They speaking in them tongues. <laughs> you don't know if it was Spanish or Norwegian or anything else. It could have been... Uh, was some Cajuns down there always talking some kind of... May have been Boudreaux getting after it. I don't know. Hey, listen to me. If it's from God, don't let it scare you. Huh? It may be uncomfortable. It may be unfamiliar. But it'll be a good thing if it's from the Holy Spirit. Anybody say amen? That's true. It's true. Um, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He's anointed me to preach good tidings. Good news to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. See, these are crushing things. To proclaim liberty. Everybody say liberty. Freedom to the captives. Freedom to the captives. The opening of prison to them that are bound. Hmm. Worked in prison ministry for a bunch, bunch of years. At one time, I'd preached in every prison in the state of Missouri and several outside the state preached in Leavenworth, Kansas. I have in this folder, the reason I brought this folder, I've got a card of Bishop that I met from South Sudan. He'd come in for the minister's conference that we were involved in there. And uh, Alapayo, and that Bishop Alapayo, you remember meeting him in October Grover. And we got these numbers here and stuff like that. South Sudan seen so much Christian persecution, so much I met this wonderful man of God and the aroma of the Spirit about him was beautiful. We got to spend, what, three, four, five days with him there at Pastor Titus's. I read last week just north of where we were at, just across the border in Kenya, ten Christians were murdered in a bus, ambushed, just because they were Christians last week. My freedom hadn't cost me much yet. What are you willing to pay? The opening of prison doors to those that are bound. As I was praying about this, and you stand, we're done right here. The opening of prison doors. The Spirit of God began to speak to me really a lot last night and even more this morning during prayer time before we came to church. And He was saying, I want to open doors. Some folks been in some prison. Some folks been in some bondages for a long time. So maybe you're here in the congregation and maybe, maybe you're watching. 
Um, if that's you, freedom. It's freedom. When I was preaching in prison, every, every person they talked to, just about, they would start talking about their outdate. Their outdate. There were some of them, Aaron, that didn't have an outdate. When I go down and preach on death row and have an outdate on this, on this earth, the only outdate they had was the day that they go home to be with the Lord. Some of them were facing execution. We live in a broken, fallen world. But can I tell you this? There's freedom in Christ Jesus. And it's blessed, it's beautiful, and it's eternal. Free people set people free. Hurting people hurt people. Bless people bless people. Jesus come to this earth free. Free of His own will. I'll go, Father. He lived it out. He walked it out. <laughs> and we're in Christ. And He says in Matthew 10, Freely you've received what? Finish it for me. Freely you've received. Freely give. The very freedom that you possess may be the freedom that someone needs. The open prison to them that are bound. Verse 3. Drop on down. Isaiah 61, 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. This is for those that have been crushed. They're in mourning. They're in grief. They're in sorrow. Anybody here in that broken place, that crushed place? Anybody watching today? To give unto them beauty for ashes. Hey, I want some of that. I'll trade. Oil of joy for mourning. I'd rather have laughter than tears. Anybody say amen? The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Father God, we bow before You today. Our Creator, You have endowed us with certain unalienable rights. Among these, life. Thank You for life, Lord God. Thank You that my mother didn't abort me. Thank You, Lord God, that I've got to live. I've been free to live in this life, Lord God. I've been free to make choices, and I've made some bad ones, but Lord God, we've lived long enough to understand that freedom's not about doing and living however we want to. It's not that right, but it is the ability to do what's right. Thank You, Lord, for opening those prison doors of this prodigal preacher's son coming home December the 19th 1978 and fellowship and relationship restored thank you for loving this prodigal back to freedom thank you Lord God for opening prison doors today so heads are bowed anybody thankful for freedom today amen anybody that needs freedom Anybody that just needs some freedom and say, hey, pastor, that's, that's me, man. I, I've got this thing just been crushing me, just going on. Slide your hand up and say, hey, that's, I'm, I'm in that one right there. That's, I'm not going to call your name, not going to call you out. There's one. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, be real. Just got a crushing thing. It's a thing. Yeah, another, another. Anybody else, another one? Anybody else just got a crushing thing going on? But I know God has freedom. I just don't know how to get free. I don't know how to get out of this prison. But I, I need God to open some prison doors for me. I need God to help me. Nobody else, government can't get me free from this one. I live in a free nation, but I'm in bondage right now. This thing's got me caught. I'm incarcerated in this bitterness, in this anger, in this hatred, in this pain, in this addiction. I'm incarcerated in this crushing circumstances. Financially, marriage, children, anybody else, I'm going to pray for you. 
Anybody else? Slide your hand up and say, man, that's, that's, I need free, DL. I need free. I need free. So I saw several hands go up. Let's pray. And then we're going to pray for our nation and we're done. Father God, thank you for freedom. It is such a precious thing. We don't have to live in our minds in bondage. We don't have to live in our spirit in bondage. We don't have to live in our flesh in bondage. You are a healer. You are a way maker. You are a prison door opener. And so we speak that over this congregation. We speak those words. We declare liberty in the name of Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Thank you, Lord God, that we're free. We're free in Jesus' name. Truth has set us free. The Son has set us free. Your Holy Spirit has set us free. We'll not come back under the yoke of bondage. It is the anointing that destroys that yoke. Thank you, Lord. That as we go to celebrate the rest of this weekend, we remember... It's more than just flags and firecrackers and sparklers. There's something very deep about this. Something very significant about this. It's a memory of a history in Valley Forge. Men who were suffering in a terribly brutal cold winter. Not enough food, not enough clothing. Not enough shelter. And yet they didn't surrender. They were faithful to the cause of the revolution. And pray, Lord God, for spiritual revolution in our midst, in our hearts, in our homes. And Lord God, that we would rise up and that we would be a voice of freedom in our land and in our community. Not just the freedom of a government, but the freedom of a truly free people, free in Christ Jesus. And that we would carry that freedom forth. Freely we have received. We freely give. In Jesus' name, everyone that agreed said amen.